here at the uh, Lighthouse Project again. Thanks for coming, Baruch Hashem, a lot of new faces. Uh, also thanks to uh, Torah Anytime, who's uh, been supporting us and uh, helping us publicize our Torah all over the world. It's truly amazing how much Siyat uh, Dishmaya we've been getting over these last couple of years. Uh, when just, uh, you know, it, it wasn't too long ago, just several years ago, if anyone that came to my personal story two, two weeks ago, what we did here, it wasn't too long ago, we didn't know anything. We didn't even know whether Hashem was real or not. And today, Baruch Hashem, our main focus in life is to, uh, to get Am Yisrael back to the Torah, get Am Yisrael back to Hashem. And uh, last night we had a shiur in Boca Raton. And uh, during the shiur, you know, once in a while we, uh, you know, we talk about Musar, we talk about Parashat Shavua, uh, but also we throw some science into, uh, into the shiur because it's always good to feel Hashem in, in a way that you could actually see. Spiritually, sometimes it's very difficult without prayer, without a lot of Torah, without learning. So in our generation, many people want to have scientific, scientific proofs of Hashem. The unfortunate part is that most of the science that we've learned until this point from public schools and universities has been a complete lie. And today, Be'ezrat Hashem, we're going to try to prove not only that everything we've learned this far is a complete lie, but also that all of the wisdom that ever existed is in a book you call the Torah. Now, most people have been celebrating this holiday in America called Columbus Day. And Columbus was famous for discovering America, even though there was already people here. He was famous for discovering America, but the bigger celebration is the fact that before Columbus, according to the historians, everyone thought that the world was flat. And Columbus said, no, 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 I'm going to continue going all the way to that point and I'm going to get to another piece of land and I'm not going to fall off the edge. And then when he continued and he got to another land, everyone says, wow, look, Ashrecha, Columbus, the world is not flat. This is just a few hundred years ago. Unfortunately, that entire story is completely false. And the reason why is because Am Yisrael has known that the world is not flat. As a matter of fact, Am Yisrael has known that the, that the globe is a sphere, exactly as we know it today, already from Mount Sinai. And all of this is in the Torah. Be'ezrat Hashem, I'll try to provide sources to everything that I say, so anyone that wants to check it, you don't want to take my word for it, you shouldn't take my word for it, you should check it yourself. But I'll give you page numbers, and I'll give you the books, and you can see it yourself. This first example is an Igmara, which is a critical part of our oral Torah. We have two Torahs. We have the written Torah, which is the five books of Moses and then the prophets. And then we have the oral Torah. The oral Torah explains what the written Torah actually says. And most people that don't want to believe in Judaism, whether it's because they're Jews and they don't want to keep mitzvot, or they're Christians and they're saying that some other guy came and saved everyone and now you don't have to do anything, all types of nonsense that people create in their mind. But everyone has a problem with this oral Torah. Even though Hashem said that He gave us the oral Torah in Mount Sinai also. But people say, no, but rabbis mentioned their names in the oral Torah. These rabbis weren't alive during Mount Sinai. Yes, but the information in the oral Torah must be divine. And Bezat Hashem today, we're going to prove that because the information they had couldn't have been information possessed by a man. The first one being... Proof that the globe, that the earth, is a sphere. In the Mishnah in Masechet Avodah Zarah, page 41, B, it says that there's all types of Avodah Zarah, there's all types of idol worship, and you're not allowed to benefit in anything that was ever worshipped. Even if it was worshipped for a day, you're not allowed to benefit from it. So the Gemara asks, okay, what about if it was a picture? I says, okay, what kind of picture? What if it was a picture of a man... I said, well, if it's a picture of a man holding a bird or holding a ball, you're not allowed to, uh, you're not allowed to uh, take it. And it's like, okay, why the ball? Why the, you know, what, what does it matter what he's holding? Gemara says that if this man in the picture is holding a ball, 
then he's representing as if he's a king controlling the entire world. And they're saying, well, why, why does it represent him controlling the entire world? They say, because the ball is a representation of Earth, the planet we live in, and Earth is round. Just like the ball is a, is a sphere, so is the world that we live in. This Gemara was written nearly 2,000 years ago. The Mishnah itself about 2,500 years ago. Columbus, many, many years later, about 2,000 years later, he did not discover that the world was round. Am Yisrael has already known. So now that we know that Columbus Day is not really a real holiday, it's just the people want to take off of work, let's learn some other things that the Gemara says. Now, in the Torah, we have a lot of things that in our current generation, people get shaken up by. For example, when I tell people that if uh, a Jew that does not keep Shabbat, according to the Halakha, according to the Rambam, he says a, that a Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat is considered a Goy, is considered a Gentile, considered not Jewish. But what kind of a Gentile? Because there's something called Chasdei Umot Olam, which is the righteous Gentiles, the righteous non-Jews around the world. Rambam says, no, no, not the righteous one. These are tzaddikim, they have olam abba. The Jew that's not keeping Shabbat, he's considered an idol worshiper. An idol worshiper. He doesn't keep Shabbat, he drives on Shabbat, he smokes cigarettes on Shabbat, watches TV on Shabbat, he's considered a complete idol worshiper. Now when I tell people this during the shul, it shakes them up. They go, what do you mean? I'm a Jew, my mom was a Jew, my dad was a Jew. I went to Beknesset three times last year. I give some tzedakah once in a while. What do you mean? I'm not a Jew. Well, according to the Rambam, you're not a Jew. Your, Jew. your Judaism is on suspension. You start keeping Shabbat, suspension's off. Now, things like this shake people up. One time I told somebody this, and uh, when he wanted to prove to me that he's a Jew, he took out his Israeli identification, which had on it Jewish. I told him, yes, you know what, you're right, but it doesn't work in Allah Abba because you can't take it. So the reality of it is that some of the sayings of Chazal, some of the sayings of the sages shake people up. So who is this Chazal? Who are these Chachamim? What proof is there that they're any smarter than us? What proof is there that the Torah is really from God? What proof is there? Bezat Hashem, Hashem will give me the words to prove it today. Usually this year is about three to four hours, so we're going to try to do it in an hour. Bezat Hashem, we'll see what we can fit. So now Hashem tells us in the Torah that there's certain types of food that you are not allowed to eat. If it's a fish, if you want to eat seafood, it has to have two signs. It has to have fins and it has to have scales. This we mentioned in our last year here, but we'll quickly go into that because this is directly in the Torah. This is in the five books of Moses. Hashem says, if a fish has fins and scales, it's kosher. If it doesn't have, if it doesn't have uh, scales, then it's not kosher. So Chazal says, what do you mean it doesn't have scales? It says, because you'll find fish that just has fins with no scales, but you will never find a fish that just has scales but no fins. Which means that this information cannot come from mankind. Why? Because in order to, if you're going to write this in a book and you want everyone to follow this book, then that means that you're not going to put something that can easily be proven wrong. If somebody goes uh, you know, to the beach and fishes a fish and they find a fish with just uh, scales, you have yourself a mistake in the Torah, chas v'shalom. If there's one mistake in the Torah, the entire book is canceled. There's no more Judaism. You, don't know, you no longer have to fast on Yom Kippur. You no longer have to keep Shabbat. There cannot be a mistake in the Torah. Why? Because it's divine. Divine means it's from God. God does not make mistakes. So now you have a situation where whoever said this, that every fish that has scales must have fins, must have known every single fish that will ever exist. There's over 2 million species that we know of on earth. There's over 40,000 different types of fish that we know of. That means that whoever said this 3,300 years ago had to have known everything that not only existed back then, but would ever exist, including mutations. And until this day, no one has ever found a fish with just scales, but no fins. You have many fish, like sharks, dolphins, and so on, that just have uh, fins. But you'll never find a fish that just has scales. Which means that even if you find a fish that's, half, that's cut off, you uh, cut off half the fish, and you don't have the side that has the fins. And you only have scales. Gemara says, 
you know for sure that it's kosher. Why? Because you're never going to find a fish that just has the scales. So this is just one simple proof that's in the five books of Moses that Bezat Hashem, all of us read every single year, Parashat Shavuot. The issue should find us in five books of Moses. Another thing the Torah says is in regards to the animals that we eat. Hashem is a big makpid. He's very, very stringent in regards to what we eat. And the reason why is he says that everything that you ever eat, whether it's ice cream or it's a steak or it's an apple or anything that you're ever going to eat is going to turn into blood. Whatever doesn't turn into blood will come out of your system. Now who told this food, whether it's a steak, to turn into blood and then the apple comes in and also turns into blood. And then on top of that, the, uh, the burger also turns into blood and the bun also turns into blood. How come it all turns into blood? Uh, because obviously there's an intelligent designer behind all of this. That this blood, according to Hashem, is part of your neshama. It's part of your soul. Which means that you are what you eat. If you eat something impure, you become impure. But what does it mean impure? Does it mean you're a bad person? No, not necessarily. It means that if you try to learn Torah, it becomes nearly impossible. Because the Torah is the only thing that's truly spiritual in the world. And it's complete purity. Which means that if you go to a Shio Torah and you eat non-kosher food, you're going to be like me when I was first starting to do tshuva. I go to a shiur, I'm completely 100% awake. Five and a half minutes into the shiur, I fall asleep. Why? Because it was, the purity was too much for my neshama to take. So it takes some training and obviously takes some kosher food. Now, Hashem said, that, how are you going to know if this animal is pure? It says it has to have two signs. It has to have split hooves. It has to chew its cud, redigest its food. You can have approximately 10 different animals that he lists, a little bit more than 10 animals that actually have 10 species that have these two signs. The rest of the animals in the world will not have any sign. It's either two or nothing, except four. There are four animals that have one sign. The pig, the herring, the rabbit, and the camel. Four animals. Four animals only have one of the two signs. Every other animal either has two signs, which means it's kosher, and the rest of the animals in the world have nothing. What does this mean? This means that if we, fi if we find animal number five, there's a mistake in the Torah. If we find another animal that has fi one sign, there's a mistake in the Torah. Baruch Hashem, 3,300 years have passed since we got the Torah, they're still looking. <laughs> Another interesting thing that Hashem said about the animals, about kosher animals, that we didn't talk about in the last shiul, is that He wanted us to identify the kosher animal from the outside because that's easy for us to, to know, easy for us to identify. But there's also internal signs inside the animals. Now, According to Judaism, in order for an animal to be allowed for us, to be permitted for us to eat them, they have to be slaughtered in a kosher way. And slaughtered in a kosher way means that the animal cannot suffer, even for one second. Now, if you look at a slaughter from the outside and you're not familiar with slaughtering, it, slaughtering looks really horrendous. It doesn't look like it's not painful, but it's actually scientific proof that it's not painful. All of the non-kosher animals, including mankind, have all of the blood at some point travels from the heart to the brain. Now someone is considered alive as long as there's blood going to the brain. As soon as the blood stops going to the brain, you're considered dead. It's not if the blood stops going to the heart. That's just a heart attack and Bezod Hashem somebody gets back. But as soon as there's no longer any more blood, going to the brain, you're considered clinically dead. So now, if as soon as we disconnect the blood from the brain of the animal, the animal is officially dead, meaning that it's no longer functioning, it's, it dies within a matter of like, um, you know, less than a second. Now all of the animals have two veins that connect to the brain on the bottom of their neck and on the top of their neck, which means that regardless of, let's say for example, if this is the head of a horse, that means that there will be a vein on the bottom and a vein on the top. So the only way, so even if we cut the vein, if we slaughter it on the bottom, 
there's still going to be blood coming from the top, which means that until all the blood comes out of the bottom, he's still going to be alive and he's still going to suffer. He's going to, he's going to feel the pain because he's still alive. There's still blood going to the brain from the top. So this means that there's no clean way to slaughter a horse or a camel or so on. But if you look at the kosher animals, if you look at the cow, you look at the lamb, you look at the ones that were allowed to eat, the deer, there's only a few animals. There's a very unique thing about their creation. They also have two veins. But right before they get to the brain, both of the veins connect and become a single vein. Which means that when the rabbi slaughters the animal is only cutting one vein and by the time the remaining blood goes from the end of the vein to where you cut to the uh, brain the animal is already dead which means that scientifically it has never felt pain if the animal feels pain it's no longer kosher so again this is something that we wouldn't have known 3,300 years ago unless God told us and Hashem is telling us that if we have this kosher food, then we can learn His Torah, then we can connect to Him. But now you have countless proofs that the Torah obviously has information that mankind couldn't have, whether it's scientific or it's prophecy. But the main thing that people have a problem with is not the five books of Moses, because even the Muslims that hate Jews still believe in the five books of Moses. They also believe in the, in the prophets. They also believe in David HaMelech. They believe in all of them. They just call it the first book, and the Quran is the second book. The Christians, whether they like Jews or not, they still believe, according to them, they say they believe in the five books of Moses, they believe in the entire Tanakh. So no one really has a problem with the Tanakh. What is the problem? The problem is with the oral Torah. So now we're going to go into the oral Torah and show that this is not just a bunch of rabbis arguing with no foundation behind it. According to scientific knowledge, in 1962, they came up with a system that they called revolutionary to save lives. They called it CPR. CPR, someone can't breathe anymore, you go with, you give him CPR, you bring him back to life. This is in 1962, and it's approximately 60 years ago, or 50 something years ago. And people call this revolutionary. This was a life changer, and technically it was, if you didn't know it existed. But according to Chazal, in Yalkut Shimoni, in last week's parasha, last week's parasha of the Miraglim, we had the spies go to Canaan, which is later to be called Israel. And what do they say they saw? They saw giants. Saw giants. Now this Midrash was written nearly 2,000 years ago. This Chazal is telling us that when they saw the giants, the giants also saw them. And they screamed such a loud scream that everyone passed out. Everyone passed out. And then it says, and the giants that lived there saw them and screamed. Uh, they all passed out. And what they ended up doing is they came up to the Miraglim, and they gave them what, something that they called mouth-to-mouth -mouth in order to breathe back air into their mouth to revive them. I think that's also called CPR. About 200 years ago, they discovered a, a way to revive someone that also lost their breath, needs to get stimulated in order to breathe by putting a tube through their throat. This was again 200 years ago revolutionary. The Bala Turim, one of the major sages, wrote about 700 years ago that there were two women written in the Torah in, in the uh, Sefer Shemot in Exodus that were, were, their job was to deliver the Jewish babies. They had two names, Shifra and Pua. Later on, we find out that that's actually Yochevet and Miriam. So Chazal asks, why do they call it Shifra and Pua? Their names were something different. Shifra comes from the word Shoferet, 
meaning to breathe in. And they used this in order to, they, she, why, why, she, why was she called Shifra? Because she would breathe in into still life babies. If a baby was born not breathing, she would give a mouth to mouth. This is even a previous source from the Yalkut Shimoni. This is a Midrash from 3,000 years ago. One of the main things that we find uh, impressive about doctors is that they're able to make surgeries less, less painful. Until just a few hundred years ago, if you were using secular medicine and you had to have a surgery, whether it's for a broken leg or it's for uh, any type of other issue, most people would actually die from pain. Most people would die from the pain because the best mechanism they had was making the person drunk, which usually is not very good for recovery. But about 200 years ago, they came up with a way that they would give someone a drug, which is in essence poison, and it would put them to sleep, and they would all hope that he would wake up. A large percentage of the people would not wake up. So now that we discovered anesthesia, where they give something in a scientific way, in a precise way, you go to sleep for an hour, two hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, they do whatever they have to do for your body, you wake up, one, two, three, and everything is great. So we're very happy about this. And we give doctors a lot of money because of this genius wisdom they have. The problem is they didn't discover it. In the Gemara, again, the Oral Torah, the Tractate of Bava Metziah, page 83b, Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the one we celebrate Lagba Omer, that guy, everyone, you know, everyone knows Lag Baum, and not everyone knows Rabbi, Eliez, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So, Rabbi Eliezer, his son, one day someone called him wicked. He says, you are vinegar coming from wine. Your father, Rabbi Shimon, he's wine, he's tzaddik, but you're vinegar. And the reason why is because Rabbi Eliezer would actually help the Goim by sending all the Jewish criminals to them. If there were Jewish criminals, you would send them to the Goim. Who wants a Jewish criminal? Someone that's hurting other Jews. You have, to, you have to arrest them. So you would tell on them. And this guy said, what are you telling the Goim about our, our, our nation? Even though they're wicked, you shouldn't say anything. So Rabbi Eliezer was questioning himself. He said, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's something to what he's saying, but I have to check this. Now I know that according to the Torah, someone that's truly righteous, truly righteous, very, very high level, after they get buried, the body doesn't disintegrate. The body doesn't get eaten up by the worms and the maggots and the snakes. And there's proof of this. There's still today, you know, when they uncover certain people and a uh, major sages, you're technically not supposed to touch it, but it's actually, it's been done many times already, where they open the graves of Sadiqim, they see people as if they died five minutes ago. This is, according to science, a scientific impossibility, but it's happened. But he's saying this in the Gemara that was written nearly 2,000 years ago. He says, I have to check this out. So how do I know if I'm going to, if the maggots and the worms are gonna eat me? So I'm going to have a surgery. He was a very, very heavy. He was very, very fat, according to the Gemara. And he says, I want you to take out the fat in my body. And then I'm going to put it out in the sun to see what happens to the fat. If the bugs are going to eat it and it becomes smelly and rotten, just like everybody else's fat or everybody else's meat, or even if you put just a piece of steak five minutes outside, there's already maggots coming out of it. He says, I want to see it. So he went. Under a surgery, we call it today liposuction. <laughs> but the beauty of it is in the Gemara, Baba Metziah, page 83, it gives you all of the details of what happened in this surgery. And what do they say? They say we gave him a certain drug to put him to sleep. We call this anesthesia. And what do we give him a surgery on? On a table of granite. Why? Because granite doesn't, doesn't absorb all the germs. We only discovered this again in the last hundred years or so. And he goes through this whole procedure and they take out, a, I think it's two or three buckets worth of fat from his body, which according to today's medicine, you cannot do. 
meaning they had more advanced medicine back then than we have today. And then he actually did, the story goes where he did put those buckets outside. No one touched it. No bug touched it. It stayed fresh. But nonetheless, again, all the credit we give doctors, God bless them for helping saving lives, but listen, you got to give credit to where credit's due. Rabbi Eliezer, he deserves the credit. He's the first one that had anesthesia, not uh, Dr. Williams. Until 1881, approximately 140 years ago, no one really thought that flies, the little annoying bug, really do anything. They just thought, listen, it's just an annoying little bug. But in 1881, scientists realized that the flies actually transfer disease. And so do mosquitoes. They transfer disease. Until then, when the Jews told them, listen, we have a Gemara, a Masechet Ketubot, page 77b, Rabbi Yochanan says, be careful of flies of Baal Ra'atan that will transfer disease. Baal Ra'atan was a certain type of disease. He says that disease is transferred to flies. Gemara, almost 2,000 years ago. So why did they read the Gemara? Oh, it's not popular anymore. So we had to wait for them 2,000 years to realize what we already have. One of the main things that's used in a lot of medicine today is silver. Silver is used in medicine in order to heal wounds. Now this again, only discovered in recent generation, but the Mishnah, which is actually 2,500 years ago, writes in Masichet Shabbat, Tractate of Shabbat, page 65a, says one is allowed to put a silver coin on an open wound on Shabbat because it's healing. So even though technically you're not supposed to touch coin, not allowed to touch uh, money on Shabbat, he says on Shabbat you're allowed to touch the silver coin if you're going to put it on a wound because it's for medicine. And in those days, if you continued bleeding, if you didn't, you didn't stop it right away, you would die. So it's considered pikuach nefesh. In today's world, obviously it's not. But nonetheless, it says it's specifically telling us that this silver has healing power. Also, there's something called opakinon. Opakinon in the Gemara, as I said, this book, I can give you a lecture for about three weeks. I'm just trying to find the interesting ones that... Opakino, according to the Gemara, is very good for, uh, for, for the ladies. Why? Chazal figured out that instead of going to the spa, spending two, three hundred dollars to get different hair removed and your skin better and all the things that women do, all you have to do is use opakinon. What's opakinon? It's an olive. Olive that's crushed and turns into oil and they would rub it onto the skin. But it's not just any olive. They have to wait specifically until the olive is a third of its normal growth. As soon as a third of its normal growth, they have to crush it and that's what they use the oil from. So they knew exactly, precisely when it's a third. And they would use that to remove hair from the body of women and make them pretty, make them shiny, and all the things that, unfortunately, ladies, you spend at least, at least a few thousand dollars a month on. You can get it for free if you learn the Gemara. See, the guys are excited about this. Like, oh, I can save some money out of this shoe. One of the major things that people have discovered just in a recent generation is that wine is good for the heart. Wine is good for the heart. But this you actually can find in both Masechet Brachot and as well as Masechet Abu Dazara and several other places in the Gemara that it specifically talks about the difference between wine and beer. It says beer is terrible for the heart, but wine is very good for the heart. So they also knew exactly what's good for the heart. They knew a lot of the things that we again just discovered recently. A second. 
Now, one of the things that people are usually inspired by is astronomers and people that talk about the stars and the galaxies and millions and millions of years. And they tell you that dinosaurs were around here, you know, 65 million years ago. And some people say that they were around 2 billion years ago. Usually the guy with the most amount of years gets the biggest grant from the government. So it, pay, it pays for them to put more years. If they start telling you, listen, the world's only been around for 6,000 years, they don't get any, any more grants. But one of the things they don't teach you is that these very same scientists that look into the, uh, into the universe and look into the galaxy also have one statistic they don't usually share with most people. Is that every galaxy, according to their, their knowledge, this is secular knowledge, every galaxy has an exploding star happen at least once every 26 years. Once every 26 years. And this is usually this is one of the ways that they can figure out how old a galaxy is. So if you have, let's say, two exp you, you see the remnants. You see these things, the remainings of the, of the star for many, many years. So if you see the remainings of 10 explosions, that means that this galaxy is approximately 260 years old. One of the things that they don't tell you is that in our own galaxy, scientists are estimating that there was less than 250 explosions, which if you do the math, that makes the world somewhere in a neighborhood of 6,000 years old, which is very, very close to what Amisail has been saying for 6,000 years. Another thing that they don't tell you is that NASA has spent close to uh, $900 billion on different programs to discover different things in the, in a, you know, for the stars, for the galaxy, for the sun. One of the things that they've tried to discover, to uh, identify is exactly how many stars we have in the universe. In 1994, NASA came out, connected a supercomputer to a very high-end telescope, and they did a calculation, an estimate, of how many stars they have in the universe. According to their estimate, there's 10 to the 20th power. So 10 with 20 zeros after it, approximately, in stars. In the year 2004, 10 years later, a university in Australia came out with a little bit of a smaller number, and they said, no, it's not 10 to the uh, 20th power, it's actually 10 to the 18th power. Now, they could have saved all this money, because on Gemara, Masechet Brachot, page 32, we have the exact number. Now most people, when they read this Gemara, they don't usually think about stars. So I'll read this Gemara to you, and you tell me what you think. The story goes where after Am Yisrael suffered from having the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, they screamed to Hashem, and they said to Hashem, Hashem, even a, woman, even a um, husband that divorces his wife, still if you ask him years later, do you remember the wife that you divorced? He says, yeah, I remember her. But you have destroyed our house, you destroyed your house, and we feel like you've left us. That's what Am Yisrael says. The fact that it was their fault for the destruction, they're not mentioning. Similar to us today. We always complain to Hashem, but we don't look at ourselves in the mirror. Oh, listen, why would Hashem give me anything good if I'm not keeping Shabbat, I'm not keeping Tarap Mishpacha, I'm not keeping kosher, I'm not keeping any laws. The last, the last law that I kept was I gave a dollar to a homeless guy. The one before that is I went to Beknesset once last year. So we have to give Hashem a reason. So here in the Gemara, Hashem answered them. They had more merits than we do. Amar la Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed is He, responded to her. Meaning he's calling Am Yisrael his daughter. Biti, my daughter, 12 constellations that I create in the firmament, and above each and every constellation I created 30 army commanders. And about each and every army commander I created 30 legion. And about each and every legion I created 30 raton. And about each and every raton I created 30 karaton. And about each and every karaton I created 30 gastera. And about each and every gastara I suspended in the firmament, meaning in the sky. I'll explain all of this in a second. I suspended in the firmament 3.65 uh, million stars. Corresponding to the days of the solar year, 
and all of them I created only for your sake. And you say that I have forsaken, that you've forsaken me and you've forgotten me. It says I created all of this for you. All of these stars. But before it gives you 3.65 million stars, which the actual number in the Gemara is 365,000 times 10,000. So before it gives you this number, it gives you all these weird words and is 12 times 30 times 30 times 30 times 30 times 30 and you get to the 3.65 million. So what is this? Chazal says this is actually the exact number of stars. It's a calculation of how to get to it. The 12 is the 12 parts of the universe. This is what we call the mazal. Or the, uh, you know, the, we have the, uh, everyone has a sign? Zodiac constellation. Zodiac constellation. There you go. So 12 constellations. And then he says each one of these constellations has 30 parts. And each one of those 30 parts has another 30 parts. And he gives them a name. And each one of those 30 parts has 30 parts. And in essence, each one of these has, is a number of stars. And the calculation goes 12 times 30 times 30 times 30 times 30 times 3.65 million. And then you get a number. And the number is 1064340, and then it's 12 zeros. The number is approximately 10 to the 18th power. So finally, they caught up to us. Finally, they caught up to the Gemara in Masechet Berhot, page 32. They could have saved all this money, maybe give some staka. We don't learn. We don't learn. We live and learn. They wouldn't get the grant. That's what it is. Another thing that's very interesting is that Hashem says that at the end of days, He's going to punish the wicked and reward the righteous with the same tool on this earth. It's called the sun. In Tehilim, Psalm 19, verse 5, David the Melech tells us that Hashem is going to burn the wicked with the sun, while the righteous are going to be revived, meaning they're going to feel a healing power with this very same sun. And David the Melech tells us exactly how it's going to happen. Hashem is going to take the sun out of its shell. Now, the last time you looked at the sun, which most people can't look at the sun for, for very long, but last time you looked at the sun, did you see a shell? I didn't see a shell. So what is David the Mel talking about? According to our knowledge, that's not scientific, this is what the sun looks like. Just a big ball of fire, right? But David Amelech says, no, this big ball of fire, that's the shell. The real sun is inside. Scientist in just the past generation, Dr. Vidal, a senior astronomer at Greenwich Observer Observatory in England, a professor of astronomy at Australia's National University. They started taking pictures, x-ray pictures of the sun and discovered something very, very interesting. The sun really does have a shell. The real sun actually looks more like this. Where the real sun is a small ball inside, which obviously in comparison to us, it's huge. But the outside is a shell. Now why did Hashem create this sun this way? Because the sun that's inside generates uh, or has a temperature that's generated of 15 million degrees Celsius. But the temperature that we get from to our Earth and the temperature that we get from the outer part is only 6,000 degrees. A little bit of a difference. Meaning that if this shell did not exist, neither would we. The sun generates every day with the 6,000 degrees that we get is more power than all the power that mankind has ever produced. And it does it every minute. Every minute that the sun exists, it creates more power than we ever had, that we've ever generated as a mankind. But that's with 6,000 degrees. If we really had the real sun, obviously it would be drastically bigger. But scientists also confirmed that the sun is precisely positioned in the only place that would allow us to live. Because if the sun was one degree closer to us, the earth would burn immediately. <coughs> if it was one degree further, we'd all freeze. Same goes with oxygen. Oxygen on earth is 21 degrees. 
the 21 uh, degrees of oxygen you have to have. If we have 22, Earth becomes explosive. The next guy that smokes a cigarette destroys the world, it becomes an atomic bomb. Everything is destroyed, just for one degree more oxygen. If we have 20 degrees of, uh, uh, of oxygen, we won't be able to live, won't be able to breathe, and the world is destroyed instantly. This is shown, showing to you that obviously all of this is very, very precise. This cannot happen as a mikre, meaning as a happenstance or coincidence. Another thing that the Torah says in Parashat Bereshit, Genesis, we talk about creation. Hashem says that He split the water from above the heavens to, uh, from the water from below the heavens. Now the water below the heavens, you know, if the heavens is the sky, Below, water below the heavens, we see it, we know it, it's the ocean. 72% of the world is, is water. So, okay, so we see that there's water. But Chazal says, no, no, no. The water here is not the real water. The water here is very, very little. The real water that allows earth, allows mankind to exist, is the water from above the heavens. So until recently, we didn't discover any water anywhere. Mars doesn't have water, Pluto doesn't have any water, the uh, moon doesn't have anything, doesn't even have the flag that they say they have. So where is this water? Especially if it's so much more water than us. And then we, these smart scientists, Dr. Sigward and Dr. Louis Frank, started looking into the stars, and they started looking into something that we call, you know, different meteors. These different things that fly around and sometimes hit Earth. And then they see something that everyone has seen at some point in their life, if they live in a city outside of New York, because there's too much pollution in the sky. You see a shooting star once in a while. Usually most fishermen enjoy this. You see a shooting star is a star that just makes a little streak. And everyone likes this, like, oh, a star is falling. It's not really a star, it's falling. What it actually is, according to scientists, and according to evidence that we have today, it's a comet. A comet is one giant ball of ice. And the streak is being made because it's going in a direct line to, uh, across the sun. So it's melting much faster than it would melt normally. So that streak is actually water, a huge amount of water. And that water arrives here. Every single day, millions and millions of comets go through the atmosphere and they melt by the time they come to Earth. And that's the actual water that revives us and that allows us to survive. So they said, okay, fine, you proved that there's water above the heavens, but where did you prove that there's more there than here? So these telescopes finally came through, finally caught up to us, and say, oh, actually, the outer shell of the entire universe. So if you have a universe, this is everything. The entire shell is ice. And these comets, these comets that we get are small little chips that break off of it. It's a little bit more than Earth. As I'll know this again, many, many years ago. One of the most interesting things that I find in this book is something that applies to our life. Most people talk freely, curse freely, speak freely, and think it doesn't really make any, there's no, there's no consequence for this. A famous Japanese doctor, scientist, Dr. Emoto, wanted to see if there's any impact by our words. So he took petri dishes, you know, these little plastic dishes you find in a science lab, and he put some water into it, and he took a few of them, and then on one of them, he cursed. The other one, he said nice things. I don't think he knew any brachot in Hebrew or anything, but he said nice things. And then he froze them. After freezing them, and he looked at the icicles under the microscope. Now the one that he froze, that he said nice things, 
came out looking very beautiful, similar to a, uh, a snowflake. You guys ever see a picture of a snowflake, what it looks like under a mi microscope? It's beautiful. That by itself is the best proof that there's an intelligent designer behind everything because every single icicle, every single snowflake looks different than another. There's, you're never going to find two of the same snowflakes. And they're all very precise, like literally like an artist drew them. And he says when you freeze the water, the water, you know, the icicles look something similar. When you say something nice, but when you actually say something nasty, it comes out a little different. It looks very black, and it looks more like death. And he has pictures in his book. I doubt anyone can see it from where you're sitting. But you'll see one end beautiful, curse looks like it's mud. Both of them are water. So a Jewish scientist, a student at Bar Ilan University, by the name of Tor Tomer Rabiav, wanted to take this to the next level. He wasn't exactly religious, but he said, listen, I always heard this Torah stuff. Let's see if it has any impact. So he took this science experiment to the next level, and he planted three beans. Three beans. One of them, he said nice things. Another one, he said nasty things. And the third one, he said Tehilim. He says, I want to see if they grow differently. <clears throat> So the one that he said nice things grew normally, grew a little bit, became a little bit of a uh, plant. The one that he cursed at died, didn't grow anything. The seed died. The one that he said Tehilim grew somewhere in the neighborhood of five times the size of the one that he said nice things to. Main reason for all of this is because your body is made up mostly of water. Technically, if you look at your body and actually what makes up your body as far as the chemicals, you can buy the chemicals in the lab somewhere in the neighborhood of like three to five dollars. Most of your body is water. Now, if the words that you're saying are impacting the outside world in such a negative or positive way, what are they doing to your body? You're mostly water. You're a little bit of a bigger petri dish. If we say brachot, the water is nice and beautiful like a snowflake. If we say klalot, we say nonsense. We talk about Oprah Winfrey in the last show that she had. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much this is going to help. I don't know how much this is going to help the petri dish you have inside you. Another very interesting thing is that if you actually go to the book of Exodus. When we were at Mount Sinai, the very famous event that unless, you're, unless someone's an atheist, everyone agrees that the Jewish people got the Torah at Mount Sinai. But we have something very interesting. It says in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, the entire people saw the thunder and the flames the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. The people saw and trembled and stood from afar. Later on, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moshe Rabbeinu also says, you saw Hashem's words at Mount Sinai. Now, Chazal says, I mean, what do you mean you saw? We heard his words. We heard the sounds. But like we said in the beginning of the Lashah, there's no such thing as a mistake in the Torah. It's divine. So Chazal actually says, the sages say, no, no, they actually saw the sounds. When Hashem spoke, there was writings on the sky. When the shofar was blown, the sound made an image in the sky. So there was some scientists that wanted to see if it's possible to see sound. One was a scientist by the name of Yaakov Guggenheim, an engineer, where he connected different machines to his uh, voice, and he started trying to make this, his voice actually make this machine draw what he's saying. 
So if he says apple, he wants the machine to draw an apple or draw a word that says apple. A similar research was done by another scientist named Chaim Ben Arav. Ben Arav Chayil Elbaz. He's a physicist. So both of them had these machines, different strategies, but the same purpose. So what do you do when you try to make sounds? If you say, ow, what is, it really, what is the machine going to draw? So you have to go to the simplest possible thing. Where do you go? To the alphabet. A, B, C, D. When they said A, bupkis, nothing came out. They said B, nothing. C, D, E, nothing. I said, oh, you know what? Let's try different language. Try different languages, nothing. Baruch Hashem, one of them was a uh, religious Jew. And he said, oh, I also know Hebrew. So he tried Hebrew. And both of them discovered the same thing. The only language that the machine draws is Hebrew. When he said the letter Tet, the machine drew an image of Tet. Exactly as we know it from the Torah. This you can't see from there. It's too far. Maybe the camera could see it. When he said Ein, he drew an Ein. Pei, Pei. You see exact. This is not like a coincidence. These pictures are a little bit bigger. When they said A, nothing came out. Looks more like an E than an A. B looked like just random. C, D, nothing. Nothing looks like anything. But if you look at the Ein, it looks like an Ein. Lamed, you see a Lamed. Bet, you see a Bet. Zayn, you see a Zayn. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet, you see the machine drawing it. From what? From sound. So apparently, Chazal wasn't kidding when they said that according to the Torah, we saw Hashem's words, there is a way to see sound. Another doctor wanted to see if we're the only ones that actually have life. So about 60 years ago, Sir Jadish Chandra Bose, an Indian researcher of inter internationally renowned and uh, one of the pioneers of research in the, in the field of plant life, started looking into this, started looking into if there's a way to prove that plants have a life. He did more and more research. And then his research, someone took a piggyback off of his research and built on top of it a uh, person by the name of Cleve Baxter. Now Cleve Baxter was actually uh, an American polygraph ac expert. He had nothing to do with this experiment. But he wanted to see one day if you could detect anything from a plant. So he connected the polygraph to the plant. Obviously the plant's not lying, he's not saying anything. So he tested it. So he brought a fish and he took the fish out of the bowl and automatically he started seeing the plant, the polygraph start making moves as if it's panicking. He put, the plant, he put the fish back into the bowl and the plant calmed down. Then he lit a, uh, a match saying to himself, I'm going to burn this plant. The plant started making the same type of uh, uh, movement as if someone that's actually in a panic, someone that's being burned. And then he said, okay, you know what? Maybe, okay, it reads, it sees apparently this plant. But can I read a mind? So his friend came into the room and all of a sudden he saw his plant making a similar gesture to someone that's uh, very upset. He says, what did you think? Honestly? He says, yeah, yeah, what did you think? What did you think? I'm, I'm researching something. I just thought that my plant is nicer than your plant. Apparently the plant also has feelings. Chazal said this already in the Torah. It says that when a tree falls, you could hear, when a tree is cut, you could hear the screams of the tree from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. 
They weren't talking figuratively. They were talking serious. A few more. The microscope was invented 330 years ago and discovered that blood cells, uh, discovered blood cells and bone marrow. And it actually learned that finally that the real healing power is in the bone marrow. The bone marrow, is, uh, as far as the significance of the bone marrow, was only discovered later. As far as blood was discovered 330 years ago, to correct myself. In the Gemara Masechet Chulin, the Gemara Tractate Chulin, page 125a, Abaye, one of the greatest sages that ever lived, he's in practically every page of the Gemara, says, an animal with the exterior wound, the brain of bone, which is in essence bone marrow, deals from within the outside, meaning that the healing comes from this, from within the uh, bone to heal this wound. There's a disease called hyperphilia, or hemophilia, I'm sorry, hemophilia. Women carry this, but it affects only men. Now, if a child has it, you're not allowed to, if a child is born with it, you're not allowed to circumcise him. And the Gemara, Masechet Yevamot, page 64b, the sages explain that they stopped four sisters from circumcising their babies after three sisters had their baby die. Why? Because they believed that they had this hemophilia. The, the uh, Rabbi Yochanan explains that I told her not to circumcise the, uh, the next child because he has this specific disease and uh, this is something that the women carry but only men receive it. The Gemara, the Gemara in Masechet Ketubot, page 77b, discusses how to heal a balaratan, that same disease that we're talking about that you can get from flies. Now, they explain, what is this balaratan? It's a growth in the brain. We call it today tumor. And the actual discussion of, of the procedure is in the Gemara. The Gemara actually talks about what exactly they did to remove this brain tumor. And they talk about how the knife that they had to use had to be very, very sharp, very precise. But unlike today, where they use a saw or sometimes a laser to cut the head, which creates a lot of blood, damage, and very, very difficult recovery, the sages had much, much better way. In order to create a hole in the, uh, in the head, in order to take out this balratan, what do they do? They put a cream. To put a very, very special type of cream on the skull, which would make it soft, and they could open it with their with the uh, very simple incision. So, doctors today are not the most advanced. Just a few decades ago, there was a new disease that came to the world according to scientists, called AIDS. And they say that the originator of the uh, AIDS, or the HIV virus that later becomes AIDS, is the monkey. There's two interesting things about this. It's not new. The Midrash Rabbah on the Masechet uh, Sota says that any place Oh no, it's Midrash Rabbah and the Gemara Masechet Sota. So it's in two places. Both of these things were written 2,000 years ago. Any place that has a high level of promiscuity will have a plague of germs that destroy the body, specifically the white blood cells. Rabbi Simalai says anywhere that you see uh, something called a... Uh, uh, anywhere that you see znut, which is promiscuity, anywhere that you see immodesty, women walking around half naked, 
which has become common today, or uh, people that are promiscuous, which is celebrated today in our world. So he says, anywhere that you see Znut, Andra Lamusi comes to the world and kills good and bad. Andra Lamusi is another name for AIDS. It's just the Gemara's language of AIDS. Now one other thing that's very, very interesting about AIDS is that when you look using Torah codes, there's something called Torah codes. Torah codes is finding secrets within the Torah using math, using computers and math. Where, for example, if you want to find certain information, let's say, for example, you want to find a, um, something that's already happened. So, for example, you want to find information about the Holocaust. Holocaust has happened, we know that it's happened. So there's different information, relevant words. You want to find where if the Torah is divine, that means that it has to have all knowledge. Not just knowledge that existed 3,000 years ago. It has to have all knowledge, including today's lecture. So now, you have to have a way to find it. One of the ways of finding it is using something called Torah codes, where you look for a specific word, and the computer program will find this word in the Torah using equal mathematical skips, meaning that, let's say, for example, you look for the word Hitler in Machshim Ovezichro, Okay, now you're looking for it obviously in Hebrew. So first you look for the, le the letter He, then you look for Yud, because obviously Hitler didn't exist 3,000 years ago. So you have to look for it, how is it gonna find it? So if the computer finds this word, he's gonna find this word where each one of the, the separation between each one of the letters has to be equal. Meaning the He, let's say there's 50, 50 letters space, and then there's the Yud, and then there's another 50 letters, and there's another, another uh, uh, letter, and so on. But it has to be equal mathematical skip. Meaning in order for you to see that this is actually not just a random word, the separation between each one of the letters to make up this word have to be equal. And the lower the number, the more you see that this is intelligent design and not just something that's random. A lot of people try to challenge Torah codes by saying, yeah, we found interesting words even in the book uh, Fiddler on the Roof and Harry Potter and all of these other books. This is complete nonsense. Number one, they didn't find anything relevant. And number two, when I tell you what they actually find in the Torah, you'll understand why there's nothing compared to Torah codes when you actually know what you're talking about. Now, when they looked for Hitler and the Holocaust and all the evil things that they did to us, they find all of these words all of them in the same page in the Torah. And not only do they find all of these relevant words, whether it's Hitler or it's the Shoah, which is the Hebrew word for Holocaust, or it's different ser sergeants that he had, the generals that he had, or the, co the concentration camps, the gas chambers, all of these relevant words that are hard to say and hard to hear, but all of these words are exactly on the same page in the Torah. And what is that page talking about? It talks about what happens when Am Yisrael doesn't listen to Hashem. The punishment we get. So you see that the page that you find all of these words is the very same page that is relevant to these words. So now, in the uh, Torah, you're going to find interesting codes. You're going to find a lot of interesting things. One of the things that the Torah forbids is homosexuality. It forbids homosexuality. Hashem says you're not allowed to be a homosexual. Now, when you're looking for the word AIDS in the Torah, and anything relevant to AIDS, whether it's the doctors behind it, that discovered it, the scientists, and the originator, which is the monkey, all of those words you find on the same page. What's the page talking about? Two things, homosexuality and bestiality. Both of which are the in essence, in Hashem's eyes, the same thing. How do we know that bestiality and homosexuality are the same thing in Hashem's eyes? Because every time that the sex crime of homosexuality is, is, uh, is mentioned in the Torah, right next to it, it talks about bestiality. To Hashem, it's the same thing. So again, someone that has this problem, I understand, they have a desire, they're born that way. We're not saying we have to kill them. But just because someone has a desire does not mean they have to act on it. You know, if you have a, uh, you know, a, a person that you know that's a, a kleptomaniac and they need to steal things, 
You know, you're not going to invite him into your house. Yeah, but, it's, but he was born that way. He's a kleptomaniac. Yeah, but let him be a kleptomaniac somewhere else. I don't want him to steal my stuff. Or if one of your children, chas shalom, has a friend that's a pyromaniac, likes to light things on fire. Yeah, but Ima, it's my friend. Yeah, but he's going to burn our house, Bobby. Go, go, go play in his house. Burn his house. Won't burn my house. Yeah, but he was born that way, Ima. Okay, let him be born that way over there. Meaning that just because someone has a desire doesn't mean we have to accept it to be politically correct. This is all complete nonsense. We have to do what the Torah says because now that we see all of these proofs, we know for sure that Hashem is the one that told us. Now, one of the things, since we already started talking about the Holocaust, and a lot of people ask, where was Hashem during the Holocaust? There's a very simple answer, and it's not politically correct. The answer is, he did it. That's the answer. He was there. He's the one that did it. And not only did he do it, he told us he would do it. He told us that he would do it 3,300 years ago in Parashat Kitavo. He also told us that he would do it in Parashat Bechukotai. When you look at the Torah codes for the Holocaust, you'll find many of them in Parashat Kitavo. But last but not least, if we forgot what was written in the Torah, he also told us about it in the Gemara, Masechet Megillah, page 6b. Yaakov Avinu is praying for Am Yisrael. And he says, Master of the universe, do not grant a sav, meaning my brother, the wicked, the desire of his heart. But here he's not talking about his brother. He's talking about Esav, the nation. Edom. Do not grant Esav the wicked, the desire of, of his heart. Do not remove his nose ring. So, Chazal asked, what does it mean, do not move his nose ring? He said, treat him like one of these bulls. A bull as big as he is, but if you pull on the nose ring that the people put on him, he loses all of his power. You can maneuver the pole as much, as much as you want from this, from this little ring. So, Hashem, so Yaakov is pleading to Hashem, okay, I understand you have to give him power. He's one of your tools to punish us if we don't do what you say. But at least put a nose ring on him. Control him. Don't give him what he wants, meaning don't give him free will to do whatever he wants to us. We still haven't talked about Germany. So now it talks about Germany. So the Gemara says, what is this referring to? Zu Germania shel Edom. Sheil male en yotzin micharivin. Kol haolam kulo. Translation, this is Germania, a royal province of Edom, who if they would but go forth, they would destroy the entire world. In Hebrew, the word for Germany is Germania. And it's saying this Germany is one of the descendants of Esav, of Edom. So now this could just be a coincidence. German, Germany, Germania, how do we know this is, this is written 2,000 years ago? How do we know this is definitely it? Number one, Germany did not exist 2,000 years ago. There was no such country 2,000 years ago. If you look at the US government archives, which I did, and you look at the history of Germany, you see that Germany was founded 800 years ago by a combination of 300 barbarian nations. 300 barbarian nations came together and created the country called Germany. So let's see what the Gemara says. Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina, this is one of the sages, says, there are 300 crowned princes in Germania of Edom, and there are 365 chieftains in Rome, and every day one group goes forth to encounter the other group, and one of them is killed. And they would then 
have the trouble of appointing a new ruler in, in his stead. So now we see that Chazal is explaining to us, yes, this Girmania, it's made out of, th it's, it's, come, it's come together from 300 chiefs, 300 leaders, 300 nations. But eventually it's going to have 365 generals within it where every day they're manipulating each other in order to kill one another in order to become the official leader. This is what actually happened to Germany. Where if it wasn't for their terrible leadership at the end, they could have actually won the war. So now that we see that even this Hashem told us about. Hashem told us about everything. The Gemara and the Sages is, not, is nothing to scoff at. It's not something that we say, ah, who is this Rambam that made this alakha about Michalel Shabbat is not considered Jewish? Who does he think he is? Who is this Rabbi Akiva that's saying that I have to keep kosher and I have to keep Shabbat and I have to lay tefillin? Who do they think they are? We just talked about them for the last hour. These are not regular people. There was actually a scientist that was a Nobel Prize winner heard about Rambam, and he scoffed at it. He says, listen, I heard that there's a statue in Washington of the Rambam, and they call him one of the 18 most important people that ever lived. He was a physicist, he was a philosopher, something extraordinary. Doctor, major sage in the Torah, they don't know him for the major sage, they don't know him for the rabbi part. They know him for the everything else. He says, what's the big deal of this guy? Why are they making such a big deal? And the rabbis that he came to says, Ah, Rambam, shh, Rambam lived almost 800 years ago. And his wisdom was something beyond our comprehension. He says, Ah, I'm a Nobel Prize winner. I know it's, there's nothing big deal about him. Like, listen, Rambam not only wrote the Alachot and broke down the Gemara, the oral Torah for us, for us to understand what to do, what not to do, what's Tahol, what's Taref, Black, white, he told us exactly what to do. But he did it in a similar style. Leavdil, obviously, the big difference. But nonetheless, he did it in a similar style as writing of how Hashem wrote the Torah. Meaning that Hashem did not put one extra letter in the entire Torah. Everything was precisely there. And there's not one extra letter, there's not one extra sentence, there's not one extra dot in the Torah. Meaning that Hashem used the least amount of letters, least amount of words, to provide the most amount of information. Einstein used to say, if you don't understand, if you can't explain something in a simple way, then you don't understand it well enough. If you truly understand something, that means that you have to be able to explain it to anyone, including a four-year-old child. To show true wisdom... You have to show it in the least amount of words. Like sometimes you see books, and they're 800 pages, but in reality, the guy could have written all of that information in 30 pages. Why did he write it in 800 pages? Either, number one, he doesn't know the information well enough, or number two, he knows no one's going to buy a 30-page book for $50. But they'll buy an 800-page book because it looks more significant. So the Rambam wrote the Alachot in the least amount of words. So this scientist scoffed at it, and he said, ah, what's the big deal? Give me an alakha, I'll learn this alakha, and I'll write it in the least amount, more, less words than him. He said, okay, learn the simplest alakha there is. Whatever you pick, you do. Go work on it as much as you want, then come back to us and explain that alakha, the entire alakha, in the least amount of words. He worked, 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 worked. Several months later, he came back. He says, okay, this is the alakha. He wrote the alakha. He wrote it in 31 words. They peeked at the Rambam, like, no, no, a little less. Few more months, 27 words. A little less. Few more months, he got it down to 21 words. Explaining an entire halakha. I mean, entire halakha, you could read several books about one halakha. So this is actually, he's not a fool. But nonetheless, he got to 21 words. It's like, ah, he was completely confident. He was like the Tamen Aviram. In our week's parasha, Parashat Korach, where after they went against Moshe Rabbeinu, they're walking with their heads high, and the Torah says they were walking straight up with a lot of gava. So he thought he got, the, he got the job done. 21 words. He opens the Rambam, 
Seven words. <laughs> and not only seven words, but those seven words explain the halacha much better than the 21. When you actually start studying Rambam, just a little bit, you start realizing that the smartest person we have in today's generation is closer to a monkey in intellect than he is to the Rambam. That's the difference. And the Rambam was 800 years ago. <coughs> he wasn't even enough to be one of Rabbi Akiva's students 2,000 years ago. Why? Because the least of Rabbi Akiva's students had enough Kedusha and wisdom to revive the dead. So the Rambam was not enough to be one of Rabbi Akiva's students. But people say, no, nah, what does Rabbi Akiva know? What does Rambam know? Who do they think they are? Okay, go figure it out. So you understand? So when we talk about the sages, it's not talking about regular normal people. To us, it's as foreign as it can be. It's closer to being an alien than it is to be a man. The wisdom that the sages had is divine wisdom. But in our generation, in order for us to do what Hashem wants, we have to have proof. We need proof because our generation is very weak. And this is the reason why it's very important for everyone to know things like this, to learn how you can feel Hashem. I'll finish it off with one major thing that a lot of people like. Because one of the things that we find ourselves in is the end of days. How do we know? This is also in the Gemara. Same Gemara. Gemara, Masechet Sotah, page 49. B. In a period which will precede the coming Mashiach, insolence, meaning chutzpah, will increase. Last time I checked, people were not very... Uh, uh, you know, they, didn't, they had the they were machmirim on chutzpah, you could say. Insolence will increase. The cost, meaning inflation, will soar. Vine will yield its fruit, yet wine will be dear. The government will turn to heresy, and there shall be no rebuke. No one will tell people the truth, what Hashem actually really said. People will be scared to tell people what it actually says in the Torah. When it says, Hashem says, Someone that doesn't keep Shabbat, mot yumat, v'nichreta nefesh v'amea, parashat b'chukotai, all the punishments. Everyone here went to synagogue, learned parashat b'chukotai. But most people don't know that when Hashem talks about the punishments, five minutes. When Hashem talks, huh? Oh, okay. When Hashem talks about the punishment, one of the parts that most people don't know is the details of what the punishments mean. And the reason why is because most people don't speak Svat HaKodesh. You may speak Hebrew like I do. I was born in Israel. I came here when I was 10 years old. But Hebrew is different. The modern Hebrew is different than Svat HaKodesh. The holy language you have to study. You have to learn Torah to know what it says. Most people that read Parashat Bechukotai, they go, okay, there were some punishments. Doesn't sound so great. That's it. So, the problem is that Hashem said a little bit more than just punishments. Is levels of punishments. And he gave us a prophecy of what's going to happen in the, the, the destruction of Bet HaMikdash. He says, if you don't do, if you continuously treat me with casualness, meaning you said, uh, you treated my Torah, you picked this mitzvah, that mitzvah, but the rest you don't want to keep. Kisui Rosh, yeah, you know what? It's not for me, but I'll, I'll wear a long dress. Or I'll wear, sometimes you see a woman with hair covering, but she's wearing a mini skirt. Like they pick and choose what they want to do. The guy is due tefillin, but it's 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Shabbat, Friday night I'll keep, I'll do kiddush, but Saturday I'm going to the beach. This is what Hashem said, you treat me with casualness, I'll treat you with double casualness, sevenfold. And each time it's even worse. And he says the details of the punishments. And I bet you that most people do not know what the fifth level of punishment is. I tested this a few times and no one knew. The fifth level of punishment says that we'll get to such, such starvation that we'll eat our babies. Hashem Echem. Now if you actually knew that, this should help you do tshuva. 
This is scary. Who wants to get to that type of a disaster? The problem is most people don't know this. They hear the parasha, but they don't actually understand what, people, what, what it actually says. This is in the Torah. Every wife, every mother, if she actually knew this, and, our, and she knew that our kids were going to public school, she'd sell the house before she continued sending them to public school. She'd sell the house. She divorced the husband, husband before she allowed the kids to go to public school. Like, this is what it says about my kids? I don't need you, husband. I need the kids. I want to save my kids. Who cares about you, husband? Save my kids. No mother in their right mind would ever do something against their kids. A, a mother that knows what it says in Parashat Bechukotai is it can, to continue going against Hashem? Mapitom. Why? Why are so many going, going against Hashem unintentionally? Because most people don't know. Why don't they know? It says it right here. There shall, ne- shall be no rebuke. This is considered a rare lecture. Continues. The erstwhile meeting place of the sages will be used for harlotry. Instead of the chachamim, the people that know Torah, getting together to come up with new halachot, and getting us to a point of connecting unity, Torah. What do we have? We have nonsense. How many people have a story that they saw a black and white so-called Hasidish guy in a strip club? A black and white so-called religious guy in a casino? How many of these stories have you heard? Many. This is what it says here. There's a lot of fake people, unfortunately. Some people are true, some people are tzaddikim, regardless of whether they wear black and white or not. It's irrelevant. I'm just giving an example, because that's what modern Judaism is, the Orthodox Judaism is known as today. But you could have the most righteous person in the world not wear black and white. You're not obligated to wear black and white. Point being is that you have so many fake people out there that you don't even know what to do anymore. You don't know what to do anymore. You don't know who's righteous, who's not. Everyone has a beard. Osama bin Laden also had a beard. So what happens when someone is secular, like I used to be, I'd see a guy playing poker with me. Only difference is I have a ponytail, but he has one in the front. He also has a big hat. And he says he's religious, but he's playing on the same poker table with me as as me. Even to me as a secular person, it stunk. I said, listen, I belong here. This is what I do. What are you doing here? It's called Chilul Hashem. But I use that as an excuse not to become religious. Because if he's doing it, that means the whole religion is fake. But it doesn't. That was just an excuse. Because once you know the information we went over, just even a little bit of the information we went over, and a lot more information that we have online, Baruch Hashem, we have over 300 hours worth of lectures. Once you learn what it actually says in the Torah, you realize it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Who cares what they're doing? You could be surrounded by heretics, or you could be surrounded by tzaddikim. You're still obligated to be a Jew. If you live on an island by yourself, and there's no one around, you're still obligated to be a Jew. A woman that lives on an island surrounded by animals still has to be modest. The man still has to lay tefillin if he has them. You're still obligated with mitzvot. The Rambam says, if you can't find a place that's not full of heretics, move to the desert. Meaning that the excuse of using people that pretend to be religious or the stories that we hear on the news every other day of some so-called religious guy that cheated or stole or did some, some type of chilul Hashem, we can't use it as an excuse in Shemaim. Because Hashem is going to tell us, listen, I gave you the Torah 3,300 years ago. I gave it to you and I gave it to him. He chose not to keep it. What's your excuse? I said, yeah, but he didn't keep it. Okay, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you that he didn't keep it. What, do you want to join him in Gehenom? It doesn't help you. He'll suffer if you want to join him. Do what he does. You want to go to Gan Eden, do something different. Do what it says in the Torah. 
The concept of Geinom is very real. We actually learned it from this week's parasha. That's where uh, Korach went. It's called Sheol. And according to the Gemara, in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 109, Korach and his congregants will never leave Sheol, will never leave Geinom. According to Rabbi Akiva, there is a machloket. Some say he may actually get out one day. Nonetheless, it talks about Geinom. Geinom is a very much a real place. So the people that say, no, no, Geinom is like a washing or it's a dry cleaning or some type of nonsense analogy that they use, okay, go wash in lava and all types of wonderful things. Good luck for that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to get washed. I don't want to get cleaned. I want to go to a good place. But it's real. Why don't people talk about it? Because it's not politically correct. It scares people. But if I told you, listen, there's a, there's a guy I know, and he has two options. Tell him, listen, you're going to do a surgery? It's going to hurt a lot. A lot it's going to hurt. But you're going to live. It's going to hurt for six months. But you're going to live. There's not to share many more years. Or I could just say, you know what? Don't do it. Don't do the surgery. But you're going to die. What do you mean? I don't want to die. I want to live. No, 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 but the surgery is going to hurt. Who needs that pain? Who wants to suffer for six months? I know a little bit about suffering. Who wants to suffer for six months? Yeah, but I'm going to die. This sounds, ri this sounds ridiculous, right? This is our generation today. They think that if we don't tell people that they're better off, how are they better off? If we don't tell them, they're never going to do tshuva. Koach is going to have more friends. But if we tell them, yes, it's going to hurt to do tshuva. Yes, it's a life change. But ultimately, you're going to live. You're going to live in a good place. Here and there. This is one of the things that the Gemara says. It's not going to happen. Why? Because the truth is going to be despised. also talks about the people who dwell on the borders will wander from, about from town to town. The wisdom of the scribes will decay and those who dread sin will be despised. Anyone that hates sin and wants to help people do tshuva, people are going to hate them. Look at my, face, my, uh, my comments online sometimes, you have some haters. Last week someone called me an idiot. Because I said that, you know, according to the halacha, there's a machloket. It's not really a machloket. It's the only machloket in our current generation about the permission of wigs or not. Only Ashkenazi poskim, a few of them mentioned that wigs in that generation were permitted, but they didn't mean today's wigs. Today's wigs are too long. They look much better than natural born hair. And Sephardics have nothing to rely on. Because there's no Sephardic Posek has ever said wigs are allowed. And the Torah didn't talk about wigs. The Pe'al that they're mentioning in the, in the Gemara is actually talking about the corner of a land. It's not talking about a wig. But nonetheless, there's still a machloket. There's still some issues. So she decided, no, she wears a wig that's probably a little too long. So she decided to call me an idiot. And uh, so I provided her sources. I told you, have an art, you have sources for what your argument is? She goes, no, I went to some rabbi and I heard he said good things. I said, okay. So my response was, someone in the neighborhood of 60, 60 or 65 sources. I don't make this stuff up. Who am I, Bechlal? The truth will be absent. Youth will blanch the faces of elders. And elders will stand in the presence of minors. In the past, someone was, an old man was sitting on a bus. All the kids would get up for him immediately. You wouldn't have to say anything. Today, it's the opposite. The old man is sitting. The kids tell him, come on, oh, get up, old man. We need to sit. Daughters will rise against the mother-in-laws. A lot of the Shlombite issues we have today is problems with in-laws. This wasn't around a few generations ago. A mother-in-law used to be like a second mother. In our generation, she's an enemy. The face of the generation is like the face of a dog. 
There's two proofs for this. One, a dog is an animal that lacks shame, licks himself everywhere, and unfortunately our generation is very similar to that. People make out in public even more. They even have shows about it, movies. There's books written about it, best-selling list. What is it, gray something? Some book about, about sex. This is, this is a bestseller, Hashem Elohim. This is a bestseller. This is the generation we live in. Generation of the face of a dog is a face of, uh, the face of a generation is the face of a dog. But there's also another one. Scientifically, there's a picture on my phone I can show anyone who wants to see it. They actually saw that scientifically, people tend to look like their dogs. And they show the faces of people next to their dogs. They tend to look alike. The hair is the same. It's, it's very, very strange, but it's very real. This wasn't the newspaper I just read. This was the Gemara. This was written nearly 2,000 years ago. And every one of the things that I mentioned to you is actually happening right now. The first time I read it, I honestly thought I was reading the newspaper. Because this is exactly what's happening in our world today. And it says, this is what's going to happen right before Mashiach is going to come. So we're going to finish it off with one thing that you could take home. Most people ask themselves, where is God? Where is God? How come he doesn't answer my prayers? Give me a proof. Give me a proof. We provided many proofs, but there's one last proof that I like. Personally, it's my favorite. In 1983, Dr. Rubenstein moved from Argentina to Israel in order to do molecular uh, biology, to do research on DNA. DNA is something you find in every living creature. He looked at the DNA of bats. He looked at the DNA of fish. He looked at the DNA of rats, monkeys. I think it was 25 or 26 different species. And one of them happened to be a human being. After a few years worth of research, he discovered something very interesting. First and foremost, all DNA has the same foundation. You have the two squiggly lines. You probably have all seen a picture of at some point. Two squiggly lines going against each other, making like somewhat of a knot, an untied knot. But in those squiggly lines, there's also these lines that look like teeth that connect the two squiggly lines. So he asked this computer program to investigate what happens if you take the two squiggly lines apart. And the computer program, after thorough analysis, responded, the subject will explode. Meaning, the two squiggly lines must stay together. Okay, next natural, rational question is, what's keeping them together? Computer programs analysis comes back with, every so often, meaning every several acids, ACTG is what it's called, every several ACTG, there is a bridge made of sulfur connecting the two squiggly lines. Okay, so these teeth that we see in the picture, very important, they're keeping the two lines together. The next question is, what is every so often? Is, there, is it random between different species? Or is it something that has some type of precision, some type of intelligent design? And the computer responds with this. Yes, it does have an actual number. It's every tenth acid, and after that it's every fifth acid. And after that it's every sixth, and after that it's every five. And then it goes back again. Ten, five, six, five. Ten, five, six, five. Ten, five, six, five. Forever. If you take a strand of a DNA and uncoil it, it can reach from here to the moon over 500 times. So this is a lot of 10, 5, 6, 5. What's 10, 5, 6, 5? Yud, K, Vav, K. The name of God. In Hebrew, not in English, not in Chinese, not in Arabic, not in Christianity, or in Muslim, or in any other false religion or false belief. In Hebrew, 
Each one of the Hebrew letters has a number, a numerical value. It's called gimatria. Yud has the number 10. He has the number 5. Vav has the number 6. And He again has the number 5. If you're looking for God, just look in the mirror. He's inside you. Any questions? Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Amen.